Bum 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 bum. Do do do. Bum 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 bum. Hey everybody. Come on in here and grab your beverage. Mmm. You know what goes goes well with the uh, espionage? Coffee. You know what goes well with treason? Coffee. So let's drink to uh, <laughs> let's let's drink to the golden age. All right. So as you know, there's this um, retired MI6 spy from Great Britain, Christopher Steele, who is the primary character behind putting together the Steele dossier that we believe is full of crap. We know that Christopher Steele did not want Donald Trump to be president. We know that he worked hard to gather information that would make him not president and went so far as even to betray the FBI by leaking the information to the media. So here's my question. Imagine, if you will, a retired CIA agent who was identified in, let's say, China with trying to change their government or interfere with their government. Just imagine that. A retired CIA agent trying to interfere with, let's say, Russia's political process, or perhaps China's political process? Do you think that those governments would say, well, this guy's okay because he's retired? Or would they execute him right away? I don't know the answer to that question, but I'm thinking he gets executed right away. Right? I'm not even sure they have a trial over there. So, am I wrong? Am I wrong that being retired isn't good enough if you're interfering with another country's elections? Let me say that as clearly as possible. I don't care how retired he is. I don't care if he's 100% retired. I don't care if he's 150% retired. If you have worked for a spy agency of another country and you come to our country to fuck up our elections, I say you should be executed. Because maybe it would stop people who used to be spies from trying to interfere in our elections in the future. And correct me if I'm wrong, but has he even been arrested? Why is this not just not, why is this not just illegal? But why aren't we actually having a conversation about executing him? Look at the trouble he's caused. Now, I will say that it, it would be a valid defense, maybe. It might be a valid defense if he legitimately thought the stuff in the dossier was true. But we don't think that, do we? Do we think that Christopher Steele believed the dossier? We don't believe that, do we? Now, he could have his day in court, and he can prove that, you know, if he can demonstrate that he didn't believe it, or that he did believe it, which would be hard to believe. So, and the, and the thing I don't understand also is why aren't we calling this British interference? I'll say it again. If a retired CIA agent interfered with the elections in another country or their political process in any way, do you think that that country would say, oh, he's not doing this for America because he's retired? I don't think they would. I don't think they would. I think they'd say America interfered with our election because the retired CIA agent is the person behind it all. Oh my God. It, can anybody explain to me 
why he is, first of all, we're not talking about executing him, or at least, you know, arresting him and finding out what, what's going on here. And secondly, why do we care that he calls himself retired? Why is that okay? He screwed our FBI. He lied to them about publicizing the thing. He totally fucked up our country. It's all we're talking about now. He practically overthrew the president of the United States. If you can't be executed for that, what the hell can you be executed for? Killing one person? You know, in Texas, I suppose. <clears throat> Execution is a bit harsh? I don't think so. <laughs> I really don't. I think execution should be saved for the, the most serious crimes. But overthrowing our government, if you were an agent retired from another country's, uh, you know, spy service, I think that should just be automatic. That should be automatic execution. Yeah, well, the Rosenbergs were a while ago, and that was over nuclear secrets. But this seems as bad. He just didn't get away with it. You know, does he get a pass because his plan didn't work? You know, did the Rosenbergs get executed because their plan worked? You know, allegedly, they they actually gave the secrets away. But just because Steele's dossier did not, so far you know, result in a change in government in the United States from one that the, that the, uh, and keep in mind that the change that Steele was trying to affect was a change from the possibility or the actuality of a Trump presidency, which was pretty much resisted by Great Britain, wasn't it? You can fact check me here, but did Great Britain want President Trump or did they want President anybody else? I am completely baffled why Great Britain is getting a free pass on this. Completely baffled. I understand that he was retired, but I just don't see how that matters because it wouldn't matter if, if it happened anywhere else. No other country would recognize that as being an important distinction. I don't think so. <clears throat> um, somebody, somebody said, should we execute Don Jr.? Let me remind you, Don Jr. is an American. When an American is involved in a political process, that's called... Democracy. That's the opposite of treason. All right? Democracy. The Republic. That's how the Republic works. It's a, uh, it's a system in which both sides fight as hard as they can against each other until we get a winner. But when somebody who's a retired agent from another secret service from a country we know wants to affect the very change that he was trying to affect, which is no President Trump, I think you have to execute that guy. You know, obviously there's due process, right? But I think we know enough about what happened to suggest that the likely outcome would be he'd be guilty of uh, espionage at the highest level. Now, even if we prove, even if we prove he did it on his own, I think it's worth the trial. Why am I hung up on retired? Uh, apparently you're not paying attention. I'm treating retired as though it's not a distinction that's important. That's my point. All right. Uh... Yeah, it just seems like anybody else would have been executed for this. I don't know why it's not at least even being discussed. Um, I saw a tweet from, was it Military Times? Uh, Military Times, a publication, did a, a non, um, what do you call it, non-scientific poll about the parade and found that 89% of their readers who, resp- 
who responded to this non-scientific poll were against it. Um, and if 89% say they're against a parade, even if that's not you know, a scientific poll, do you keep looking into it? You know, if it had been 60-40, I would say, well, it's not a scientific poll, just ignore that thing. But once you get to around 90%, <laughs> about 90%, even an unscientific poll, uh, you got to start listening to that. You know? All right. Yeah, and then there's that Blumenthal connection, and there's Senator Warner, and there's all that. This has become the most um, complicated set of uh, scandals. Are they scandals I've ever seen in my life? Yeah, you know, if there are people from other countries who are not attached to intelligence services who did things to interfere in our country, I have a very different feeling about them. But being a retired MI6 guy and and trying as hard as you can to change our, our election results, uh, I think that's execution. Or at least it's got to be in the conversation. Um, Military Times is a liberal... Really? There's a Military Times liberal publication? I'm not, I'm not arguing with you, but that would be interesting. Um, oh, treason is betraying your own country. Yes, that's correct. So it wouldn't be treason, it would be espionage. Or, what, or whatever, whatever you'd call it. But yes, you're right, it's not treason. Um, <laughs> yeah, the the whole uh, the whole Russia movie is now so complicated <laughs> that uh, let, let, let me uh, self rate. I would say that my um, my level of attention to the news is probably at least in the top five percent. Wouldn't you say? Those of you who have watched me for a while, I would say that my paying attention to the news, looking at both sides, looking into the issues, is probably in the top 5% of the public, if for no other reason than because I do these periscopes. And I have no idea what's going on anymore. I've completely lost the story. Every once in a while, I think I do. You know, I'll be thinking, okay, I think I got it now. You know, this person did this, this person did this. And then the very next thing I read will be, well, but what about the timeline? And what about Blumenthal? And what about this? And then I think, uh, well, I don't know. I just don't know. Somebody said Steele was hired just as a cover for the information. I don't care. He took the job. <laughs> I don't care. It's it's all the same crime to me. Um Now it's a mini series. Yeah. Someday this is going to be a mini series. You know it will. Will there be elephants in the parade? <laughs> um, all right. So what other topics do we have here? Oh, so we have this uh, Rob Porter story. Let's talk about the Rob Porter story. And the only reason I'm going to talk about it is so that people don't say, hey, why didn't you talk about it? If I could ignore it, I probably would, because it's my preference to ignore that class of stories, no matter who it is. It doesn't matter which side it is. It's my preference that, that those feel like stories between the 
victims and or alleged victims and the perpetrator and or alleged perpetrator. Um, so I'll just say the obvious, which is we, you know, it's a legitimate question of how much um, Kelly knew and, you know, what he didn't know. Um, so it's a fair question. And is there a chance that Kelly will be taken out by this? Yes, there is definitely a chance. I don't. I couldn't put odds on it right now. Um, but have you noticed that this whole political atmosphere now seems like a, a chess game, and that the 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 uh, purpose of the chess game is not just to get the king? You know, ultimately you want to you want to get the king. Uh, or if Hillary had won, it would have been get the queen, I suppose. Although that makes my chess analogy not work as well. She's got to be the king either way. Um, but now there seems to be a concerted effort to take um, to take pieces off the board. And I'm not saying they don't deserve it. I certainly wouldn't say that. And, you know, the evidence against Porter looks pretty darn bad. Um, I'm, I'm certainly not going to be defending anything he did. But at the same time, you wonder if this would have happened in a different world where it wasn't so polarized. And it does seem to me that every time one side takes a piece, the other side has to look for another piece to take. So the anti-Trumpers have been chipping away at the Tr- Trump White House you know, since day one. You know, look, how about this one? How about this one? How about this one? And of course, this is just the perfect scandal for the anti-Trumpers because it it brings up the question of allegations against the president himself and it puts him in a position of judging somebody who's been accused of not the same crimes, but, you know, in the same, same uh, general conversation of bad things that men do to women. Um, and so... CNN has been practically orgasmic over this whole thing. I've never seen a network so happy while pretending to look sad. Um, And it's actually fascinating to watch. Now, on Fox News, they mention the news, so they mention the Porter thing, but they're giving it a lot less weight, whereas CNN is wall-to-wall, Porter, 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 um, he must be killed. And I'm noticing uh, a weird phenomenon and maybe this is maybe this is something you've you've all noticed before but uh well okay you beat me to it somebody beat me to it in the comments it does seem to me that cnn is a female dominated news outlet and that fox news is a male dominated outlet now when I say dominated, that doesn't mean that, you know, the other gender doesn't have anything to do or they have no power or anything. But in terms of the, the way they're positioning themselves, <clears throat> um, CNN positions itself as men are bad and Fox News positions itself as that, you know, men can at least sometimes be good. <laughs> so it's sort of turned into, <clears throat> it doesn't feel like watching politics anymore. Does it? I feel like it, I think it started as a political sort of thing, but these days it seems like CNN's news is really to belittle um, men in power. All right, you know, and let's say the patriarchy in particular. It seems like their their deal is to elevate, you know, women and gay men, and to demote. Uh, straight men in a variety of ways that just comes through in terms of the types of coverage that they focus on. Whereas Fox News still seems to be, um, you know, alpha male domain and, and the women there are, are women who would not mind a world in which men are men and, you know, they, and they can, uh, they can be lumberjacks and, and whatever else they want, I suppose. But are, are you noticing that? Somebody said estrogen versus testosterone. That probably, 
but probably pretty, comes pretty close to it. Yeah, so I'm not saying that CNN has no men working there, and I'm not saying that Fox has no women working there. I'm saying that the philosophy of CNN is that adult white men are just not to be trusted. And that, and by the way, they have pretty good argument for it. <laughs> I'm not saying they're wrong, <laughs> but that seems to be their thrust. Um, whereas Fox is, is more pro, pro male while also being pro female. It's just that they have a little bit more of a male centric vibe to them. Yeah, plenty of exceptions, of course. Scott, do you think the world is becoming more feminized? Yes, of course. Well, the Western world, I can't speak for any place else. Yeah, the, the world is absolutely becoming more feminized. And it's up to you to decide if that's good or bad. I think it depends which network you're watching. Do you think there's a problem with that? That's a good question. So somebody, well, I'm not sure which question you're saying, do I think there's a problem with that? So somebody said, do I think there's a problem with that? I think the question was, you know, is the West becoming more feminized? And somebody said, I said, yes, it is obviously becoming more feminized. Somebody said, is there a problem with that? Uh, My guess is that it's going to be a mixed bag. And I don't know how to measure it. So I think there's some some good and some bad that comes with that, just like any big change. There's no such thing as a big change that has only good or a big change that's, well, maybe only bad, yeah. The moment I say that, I can think of exceptions, but... Will CNN die soon? Well, not only will CNN not die, because I think their ratings are doing fine, um, but did you, uh, did you see that Twitter had its first quarterly profits? So one of the legacies of the president of the United States, just guessing, is that he made, I think he made Twitter profitable. Am I wrong about that? Didn't, did President Trump make Twitter profitable this quarter? Their first quarter they've ever been profitable? I think so. Uh, I saw a question go by. Somebody asked me what I think of Larry Charles. Uh, Larry Charles, I worked with him. He was my co-executive producer on the Dilbert TV show. He was one of the original um, Seinfeld writers. He's He did the Borat movie. He was the director. He's done a lot of things you've seen. Um, the He did. He directs a lot of uh, uh, Larry David's stuff, etc. Anyway, so somebody said... What was he like to work with? Uh, honestly, he's one of my favorite people in the world. Um, I just saw him a few, I saw him like a month ago, uh, and I hadn't seen him in years. But uh, he's doing a a, a new uh, documentary about dangerous comedy, and I was interviewed for that. And I just love catching up with him. He's probably one of the most one of the most interesting people you'll ever meet in your life, if you ever met him. Um. Comments about SpaceX and Elon Musk? Well, I'll tell you. The difference between someone who's just a good CEO and someone who's a master persuader is sending a Tesla to to Mars with with a little character or spaceman in it. That could not have been better. All right. In terms of you know the imagery, the the way it made you feel as an American, because if you think about it, you know the automobile is about as American as you can get. So you've got the you know two symbols of you know great American symbols: the space program, which at least we think is sort of an American thing because we got to the moon and and all that. And then automobiles. We think of that as at least invented by, you know, primarily an American thing. Yeah, I know the Germans and the Japanese will will argue about about that. But we feel like it's an American thing, cars. He puts them together, and he and he ships and he shoots them to the moon. 
<laughs> or shoots them to Mars. And I'm thinking, honestly, that just could not be better. That That is a home run times two. <clears throat> yes, it was expensive. Um, yeah, I did mention him in one of the comics that, a Dilbert comic that's on the calendar, apparently. He's an African immigrant. True story. But he's very American. Um, <laughs> thoughts on Rand Paul? Um, oh, no, nothing new. In other words, I don't have any interesting thoughts about him right now. Um, all right, I think I'm running out of things to talk about. The, the news is kind of weird today, because unless that, unless that Democrat memo comes out, yes, I am close to a train. You can actually hear the train on my microphone. Wow. <laughs> Does a golden age mean it will be good afterwards? Well, let me explain the golden age here. So I've been telling you that I think we're entering a golden age. Um, and the golden age I'm going to define as, as just everything's moving in the right direction. So the economy is moving in the right direction. ISIS is moving in the right direction. Um, the, you know, maybe there's something happening in North Korea that's in the right direction. You know, there's just a lot of stuff moving in the right direction. Um, now let's talk about stocks. Does anybody remember me saying just, I think in the past two weeks, if you're a regular on my periscopes, can somebody confirm that I said that we were certainly going to have a correction, maybe 10%? Does, does anybody remember me before the correction saying that uh, uh, somebody said, will there be a correction? And I said, 100%. Because there always is, all right? It's the easiest predict prediction in the world is to say that there's going to be a 10% correction. Because there's no way that the, you know, the stock market doesn't just grow in a straight line to the moon. It gets ahead of itself, it pulls back. It gets ahead of itself, it pulls back. So um, I, think, I think you have to add that to my correct predictions even though I'm going to say that was an easy one, and probably if you had interviewed, my guess is if you'd interviewed anybody who does this for a living, you know, anybody who's in the market and studies finance, probably 100% of them would have said, oh yeah, we're going to get at least a 10% correction you know, sooner or later. So that was kind of easy. Um, talk about Bitcoin, please. I, I have been ignoring the, the details of Bitcoin, you know, the more sort of detailed arguments about why it's good or bad or why it's flawed in some way or why some other cryptocurrency is better, et cetera, uh, in favor of just sort of looking at the, the, the feeling, you know, the psychology of it. Bitcoin is entirely driven by psychology. And psychology can change in a moment. So, and we've seen that up and down. Uh, um, I think I told you a while ago that the reason I, I bought, I bought a, not Bitcoin directly, but I bought a, a mutual, um, an index fund that just owns Bitcoin. Uh, so I have it through the market. So I think I told you I did that so that I could stop Bitcoin from going up because people were getting rich without me or richer without me. And I was like, I can't have this. They're getting rich doing no work. So I bought some Bitcoin so that it would stop going up. So far, nailed it. Um, actually, it's, it's up, I don't know, 50% or something, maybe 100% since I bought it. But uh, it sort of, sort of stopped after that. <laughs> um, so I'm going to hold my Bitcoin investments. Uh, this is not investment advice. Let me say it again, this is not investment advice. But I can tell you just factually 
that I'm holding on to my Bitcoin. Um, I am already rich. That is correct. Do you read Sundance on THC? I don't know what that means, but no. What do you think of Peter Schiff and his economic predictions? What are his economic predictions? Um, I don't think he's an economist. And even if he were, would I believe them? (laughs) Do you play the market yourself? Uh, I don't play the market, but I'm heavily invested in the market. The difference between playing the market and investing in the market is that investors buy broad indexes, you know, diversified, and they hold for a long period of time. So that's what I do. I buy indexes and hold. I do not play the market as in buying and selling individual stocks because I'm magic and I think I know when they're going up. I used to think that. I don't think that anymore. How scared are you of the weak dollar and raising inflation? Well, inflation is a guarantee. It's It just sort of comes with a strong economy. Um, so I, I've heard it said that the president actually oversold the economy. In other words, optimism got too high, so that's why the stock market got ahead of itself a little bit. And by the way, let me let, let me pause to say this. Do you think it's good news or bad news? that the stock market pulled back? Let me see your answers here. Is, is it good or bad for the economy that the stock market pulled back a little bit? Yeah, it's only good. Not only is it good news, it's 100% unambiguously good. <laughs> There's no question about it. Right? It's as good as it gets. Because if it had kept going up on, I was, I was way more worried that it would keep going up, right? Yeah, if you look at the comments, it's 100% people saying good. The, the people are either saying normal, good, or great, right? So is the news reporting it the way 100% of us see it? 100% of us say, oh yeah, it's good that it pulled back a little bit because you don't want the market to get ahead of the reality. And the reality is good. If the reality were not good, well, that's a different situation. But you want you want your stock market and your reality to be loosely connected, which they were getting a little disconnected. So, uh, amazingly, people are reporting this like it's um, bad news for the president when I think 100% of experts in stock markets and, and, and the economy would agree that these you know pauses or pullbacks, these corrections, if you will, are just normal and positive parts of the, the market. Somebody said, "Do I like the Fed?" I'm not sure what it means to like the Fed. I will tell you that I studied economics in college, and I don't know what the Fed is. Now, I don't think that's on me. Because I'm pretty sure that the people who say they do know what the Fed is don't know what the Fed is. Right? So I don't think it's the case that some people know what the Fed is and some people don't. I believe some people say they know what it is and don't, and some people say they don't know what it is and don't. Yeah. Obviously, there are some people somewhere who know what the Fed is, but hopefully the people who work for the Fed. But the... The normal citizen, even one who has studied this field, doesn't exactly know what this Fed thing's all about, you know, in total. You know, we know some things it does, but we we generally don't understand it. <laughs> um, don't they just provide liquidity to the market? Well... You, you could boil it all down to a word, but it won't let you understand it. <laughs> yeah, yeah, we know what the Fed is supposed to do. That part's not hard. But there's more to it. Um, yeah, it's not that I didn't learn it. It's just when I learned it, I looked at it and I said, um... These explanations are not good enough for me. I I feel more confused than elucidated. (laughs) 
So I, I got in a little uh, Twitter spat yesterday with someone who, you know, I hate, I really hate on Twitter to call somebody an idiot because as a, as a matter of philosophy, generally speaking, I just think people are seeing the information differently. They have different priorities. You know, maybe in some cases people are just trying to persuade. They're not being honest. But rarely is someone who disagrees with me on Twitter just clearly an idiot. They might have less information, you know, but that's not an idiot. That's someone who has different information. They may have different priorities and all that. But yesterday there was like a real idiot, like one of the intelligent idiots. And, and the, uh, and I called him out. I just said it was the dumbest thing that I'd seen in a year. And that might be true. And here's what it is. It was somebody who told me once again that all I had to do to understand that climate science was real and that I should worry about it is to do a little bit of my own research to understand the basics of climate science and then I would, I would understand and then I would be on the alarmist side. And I said to myself, okay, that's not just a different priority. That's not someone who has different information. That is someone who is really stupid. Like there's, there's a brain problem there. And, and yet it was someone who clearly had a higher education and, and was even promoting higher education by their comments, you know, saying I should be more educated. But who really thinks that they can check the work of a climate scientist because they read some magazines. Uh, I don't think that's a thing. And moreover, um, the other people I'm, I'm going to say are not stupid, but they're under-informed, so it's a different category. The people who will send me a link that's either pro-climate um, alarm or anti-climate alarm. So people send me both links, and they, and they triumphantly proclaim that they've proven their point. There it is. There's my link. Look at my link. It's from real scientists. It's from NASA. It's from the experts. It's from the 97%. And the other one will be like, well, you know, this is science. Look at it. These are facts. And it disproves the other side. And I say, I say until I'm blue in the face that the problem is not that your link is not convincing. It's the opposite. The problem is that the link you send me, no matter which side it takes, is completely convincing. Most of them. Not everyone, but most of them. They're all convincing. Why? Because I'm not a scientist. I haven't studied this field. And when I look at you know some graph somebody put together with a line on it, and I look at it and I go, well, yeah, I mean, if that's true and there's no other part of the argument, well, it looks pretty convincing to me. And then 10 minutes later, somebody will send me a link that takes the other side, and it'll be completely different information. Again, there's a, a little graph made by somebody I don't know with data. I don't know if it's real. But I look at the graph, and I go, well, it's pretty convincing. <laughs> it looks pretty good to me. It, anybody who pretends that they understand climate science to the level where they can take a side with confidence, that doesn't even strike me as trying. <laughs> like That's not even trying to be smart. I don't know what that is. Now, it could be that some people are so siloed into their side that they've just never seen links from the other side. Or if they do, they say to themselves, ah, 97% of the people are on the same side. I don't even need to look at that link, or it must be, must be garbage. But if you actually look at these stories, both pro and con, you can't tell me that one of them is more persuasive than the other because they are both 100% persuasive, like really, really persuasive, and they're completely opposites. But they're sure persuasive. Most anti-climate scientists are funded by oil companies. Are they? 
<laughs> Literally every fact that somebody alleges about climate science, my first reaction to it is like, maybe, probably not though. Yeah. Um, well, somebody said most, and you know, would it may even matter if most were? Suppose 60% of anti-alarmist people were funded by oil companies. That would still leave 40% who weren't. So. Um. Yeah, you can't tell the difference between the science and the propaganda these days. All right, do you think we're going to see the uh, Democrats' memo today? Um, Some people are saying it might be Saturday. (laughs) Do I have any black friends? Um, I know why you're asking because of the Chris Siliza quote. Um, yeah, so if the, if the Democrat memo is not interesting, maybe it will come out on a Friday. (laughs) Do I have any hardworking friends? Yeah, most of my, well, I don't have many friends left. Let me say that. For a moment there, I started to answer, um, as if I still have friends. But I have to be honest, I don't have many friends left. I had lots of them two years ago. <laughs> well, yes, I'm, you're all my friends. Um, <laughs> I, was, I was listening to... Uh, well, there was some uh, audio clip of a professor, I forget Professor Ware, who was saying that he'd be happy if Trump died, and then he quickly added of natural causes. But actually saying in public that he'd be happy, happy, if the president died. Now, obviously he thinks the president is you know a monster and needs to... Uh, you know, he's, he's ruining the world. But doesn't, doesn't that mean that that professor thinks the same thing about you and me? Doesn't that professor want all of us to die? The, it's really funny. The, uh, the Democratic Party has become so full of hate that they're unrecognizable now. People say that about Hillary. Yeah, I'd never heard it about her, but I'm sure that they have. <laughs> you know, I'm, I'm starting to wonder if, if Trump left office right now, you know, like after one year, he just left after one year, Wouldn't he still be one of the most successful presidents of all time? I mean, I think history is going to be pretty good to him. Now, uh, I, of course, have also given him a grade of F for race relations. His race relations is almost hilariously bad. There are just so many things he could do better that he doesn't seem to think is important. I mean, just take, just take the most obvious thing. Um, if you're on the Republican team, and let's say you're, you're black, you are elevated to the highest level of respect if you're a Republican and you're black. Because if you're American, you're in the top tier. That's the whole America first thing, right? There's no such thing as being a legal American who's obeying the law 
and being anywhere except the top tier. If you join, you know, if you're on the, the Democrat side, you're sort of below women, and you're certainly not in the top tier, but you're competing for it. You know, you're, you're one, of the, one of the groups that is competing within their more diverse area for, for influence and power. Let me, let me tell you another, uh, another idea. I think I may have said this before, but I like this idea so much I'm going to say it again. I think it's impossible for any um, diverse society to have literal, complete equality of outcomes anyway. Hold on a second. Hello? Hello? Oh, I'm 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 sorry. I I didn't hear that first burst. I didn't hear the first part. Could... Yes, I am calling you from Microsoft, and this call is regarding to your computer. Oh, you're from Microsoft, and you're calling about my computer. Is there a problem with my computer? Yeah. Yes, sir. Your computer was sending an error messages to a global server. Is the reason I'm giving you a call today to avoid you for this? Oh my God! What kind of error message was my computer sending to the global network? Uh, we are receiving some kind of application error, blue box error, critical error. A, a critical error of what kind? What was the nature of the error? Hello? Oh, he went away. I hate it when my scammers hang up on me. <laughs> so here's what I was going to say. In a diverse society, it is probably functionally impossible to, to achieve total equality of outcomes. You can get pretty close to equality of opportunity, but even that, you can't get exactly right for everybody, even if you try. So I would suggest that a better standard would be equality of strategy. If you have strategic um, parity, you have everything you need. Not technically. I mean, you don't have identical situations. But if you had strategic parity, you'd be in good shape. All right, and here's what I mean by that. If you were, um, if you were, let's say, a, uh, you know, <laughs> if you're a woman, do you have any advantages that you can take advantage of? And yes, because there are places that would like to hire more women. Um, there are places that need to increase their quotas. There are places where women um, succeed more than men. So you have, you have a strategy of doing something that men can't do, right? Men can't get a job because they're women, because they're men. Likewise, if you're black, um, there's, you know, every Fortune 500 company is looking to improve their, their ratio of diversity. And so you'd go into those places with an advantage. Now you would, you would have a disadvantage, presumably, getting into a small private company that might be racist. Right? But for every disadvantage, as long as there's another path where you have an advantage, you have at least strategic equality. And I think that that would be important to not only teach kids. Imagine, you, imagine I go into a... Just imagine this, right? Imagine I go into a black classroom someplace in some poor or urban area you know, and let's say it's just mostly black. And I teach strategy. And I say, you know, you've been told it's a big racist world, and you're not totally wrong about that. But there are still channels of strategic advantage that you have that are completely available to you. And so, for example, um, if you do well in school, Chances of getting a you know paid scholarship are pretty good 
if you're black. If you get a scholarship and go to college and get a college education in a in a field that has some value, you know, not a crazy major, but you know, a functional major, your odds of getting a job if you're an educated black person who stayed out of trouble close to a hundred percent, wouldn't you say? I mean, I would guess that the that the um, unemployment rate for um, let's say for black people with a four-year education, I've never seen that number, but I'm guessing it's low. Does anybody has anybody ever seen that? I would think that the unemployment rate for anybody with a college education is going to be better than for anybody else. But once you know, especially if you're black and you've got a college education, there are enough Fortune 500 companies that are saying, "Oh, our diversity is terrible. We need to improve things. Let's recruit a little bit harder from the African American community." I, w- I would think educated black um, applicants have the lowest. You know, maybe among the lowest unemployment rate. I, please fact check me on that. I could be wrong on that. But the point is that as long as everybody has a path, then at least they can use a different strategy, but still a strategy. As long as everybody has a strategic path to success, it might be that that's as close as you can get. You know, We'd like full equality in all things, both outcomes, opportunity, you know, on some conceptual level, we'd all like that. But probably you can't get there. And even if you got there, people would disagree about whether you were, in fact, there. But you could certainly have strategies that are going to work for different groups in different ways. Um, is it easy to become a black cartoonist? It is. Yes, it would be easier to become a black cartoonist, all things being equal. You know, let's say you had exactly the same skill as as other people who were competing for the limited positions. Um, newspapers newspapers would um, give you a, an advantage, absolutely. And the same would be true for a female cartoonist. You would get a little extra, a little extra juice for being either woman or African American. Uh, It's probably not easy to become a cartoonist to begin with. That is true. Does there happen to be a famous black cartoonist? There have been several. <clears throat> yes. Um, no one should be denied or guaranteed a job based on genetics. Well, I think everybody agrees on that. I can't. In my lifetime, I don't know if I've ever even met anyone who said that someone should be de- denied a job because of their ethnicity. When, uh, let me ask you. Um, now, obviously, racism can be subtle, so you know it's not all the overt stuff. But uh, which have you heard more of? I've been in lots of conversations where we explicitly... Um, you know, this is my corporate days, etc. I've been in lots of conversations where it was explicitly said out loud with no ambiguity that we were preferring non-male white candidates. I've been in that conversation a lot. I've never been in a conversation where anyone, anyone ever said, let's hire the white male. I've never been in that conversation. Now, it may be that they just get the job anyway because you don't have to have the conversation. But I've never had that conversation. They don't say it, but they think it. Maybe. You know, it's not my experience that that there's anything that people think a lot that they never say it, at least in private. <laughs> you know, they would say it in private if they thought it. And I've never even heard it in private. No, nobody has ever said to me privately that they would have a problem with a black candidate or a female candidate. I've never heard it. I do agree that it exists. So, you know, somebody will take this out of context and say, um, he's saying racism doesn't exist. I'm not saying that. Of course it exists. 
I'm just saying I've never heard it. Explicitly. I'm sure it exists in general. People's resume is rejected if the candidate has a black or ethnic sounding name. Um, now, to that point, if, if you were um, advising a, a young black person on how to succeed in life, and you knew that there were studies showing that people who have black sounding names, I guess probably just first names, you know, like Deshaun or something like that, that they, they get rejected before they even get an interview. If you knew that, wouldn't you advise a young black person to change their name? Now, you could just say, damn it, I'm, I'm proud and I'm going to keep my name and you know, other people have to change, not me. You know, I should be able to have any name I want. Uh, we agree with all that. I agree you should be able to do that. I agree that it shouldn't make a difference, but it does. All right. You know, according to the studies, it does. So change your name to, you know, Eric. You can change your name. Just change your first name. Just change it to Bob. Eric. It's like the easiest problem to solve in the world. Um, yeah, and as people have said here, people coming into Ellis Island, a lot of them change their names to avoid the ethnic branding. So if there are ways... Here's another, here's another thing I would advise. Um, and some people ask me about Hawk Newsom all the time. He's a leader of Black Lives Matter and in New York. And um, he's also very religious, so he's very Christian. And it comes across in his casual conversation as well as his public conversations. So his Christianity is you know, quite central to his, um, to his personality and to, to his communication. And I'll tell you, if you tell me, uh, go talk to this um, representative of Black Lives Matter, and I didn't know that his primary core was Christianity, I would definitely have a different feeling about it. But knowing that he's coming from that as his central core place makes me say, all right, I'm going to listen to what you have to say. And indeed, you know, in in at least our conversations by, you know, digital means. Um, He's a genuinely nice guy. I mean, his Christianity is part of his personality. And I believe, as far as I can tell, his motives are are entirely Christian. All right. So if I were advising a young black man to, you know, how to to get an advantage, how how to have a strategy... That's going to help you. I can't think of anything better than joining a white church. Keyword, white. If a black man joins a black church, that's still good because being religious in any way does give you a leg up in, in American everything because it's a religious country. But if you wanted to get ahead and you wanted to network, chances are the white church is going to have more rich people because of just the difference in the demographic, uh, you know, the economic demographics of it all. So if half of life is who you know, and it is, having something in common with the people in your church, which is Christianity, um, just as an example, could be some other church, uh, that gives you an automatic credibility. You know, you would be, you would be embraced totally. You know, if a black person joins a mostly white church, I'm here to tell you they are embraced completely right away. Because if you've got that in common, you know, you put a little American flag on your bumper sticker and you go to church in a mostly white church, you can have all the connections in the world and there's nobody who's going to judge you for any of that. So now you may say to yourself, and this would be fair to say, you may say, I'm not going to sell out. I'm not going to. I'm not going to change. You know, I don't want to be you know less of who I am. You know, 
just to get along with white people. To which I say, I'm a white person, and do you know what I do to get along with white people? I change, all right? You can't even be a white person without having to conform to what white people, you know, like or what they respond to or dealing with them. You know, it's not, it's not like I like to be. You, do you think I like wearing dockers? I mean, seriously, folks. You know, do I wake up in the morning and say, you know, I love these dockers. I'm going to wear these. I do not. You know, but if you're a white guy who wants a office job and it's casual Friday, you put on your frickin' dockers. All right. So conforming to what other people think you should do is how you succeed. All right. I mean, it's great to be a rebel and it's great to, you know, buck the crowd. You see me do it all the time, but I don't get to do that stuff until I've paced. Right. So you have to pace who you're trying to persuade, and and success in life is mostly about persuading people. You have to be like them first, be similar to them, match them in any way you can, and only then can you do something out of the box and people will say, well, he's mostly like us. You know, we'll, we'll indulge him, this little difference there. Um, yeah, there's... There's no white person who wakes up and says, uh, I love my white culture. I want to be super white. I think I'll just, you know, act like the other white people. We do it because it works. It's functionally, it's functionally useful to try to fit in. So my, my advice for anybody who is young and black and wants the best life that they can, they can get, Figure out how to fit in with people that you don't even love. You know, people who, people who are boring, people who, you know, may not be your first choice, people who are a little bit uncomfortable for you to be around, maybe, because that's where all the opportunity is. You know, join a white church; it would be amazingly useful for your career. Um, but keep in mind that everybody sells out to get ahead. It's just a question of how much you sell out, right? But you want to sell out a little bit. You want to conform a little bit. You know, you want to you want to match the audience a little bit before you take them somewhere. Uh, bum, bum. <laughs> and pull the dockers up. That's funny. It's not selling out, it's buying in. Well, that's a good frame of it. And you're not selling in, you're buying in. You know, if you think of it as selling out, you end up not wanting to do it. But if you say, I'm, I'm uh, pacing so that later I can lead, that feels completely different than selling out, even though it might look the same on paper. Uh, have you noticed more mixed race couples in TV ads? I have. I always think that's a good sign. You are getting in the game. Um, uh, do quotas help address past discriminations against black people and women? Well, <clears throat> let me give you my, my long arc of discrimination story. So my long arc of discrimination story is that when things were the worst, let's say the times of slavery, you know, women couldn't vote, you know, and, and slavery existed. The tool to fix that is something big, like a civil war. Then you get to, say, the 50s and 60s, where the laws are not quite equal, well, to change laws, maybe you march in the street and people get beat up. It's not as big as a civil war, but it's still violent and takes a lot of energy to get anything changed. Then you've got the laws equal, but people are still not being treated equally under the law. Right? It's okay to have the laws equal, but you know the, the, the humans are not treating people equally under the law. Then you need to use the court system. 
All right, so you go to the next level of refinement and you say, all right, the law is the law. You didn't rent me this apartment because I'm black. You know, you're going to pay some money or go to jail or whatever the, whatever the um, penalty is. So the legal system is still sort of brutal, but not in a violent way. So you've gone from civil war to, to deal with a big problem to the civil rights movement and marches and still violence. Big movement, a lot of energy, even some violence in there, too much of it, for a still pretty big problem, but not civil war big, but big. And then it's like lawyers, you know, suing people who were discriminating. And, you know, that's, that's big, but it's not as big as, you know, the 60s discrimination. And now we're in this, what I'd call the, uh, uh, let's say the final mile. Okay. I'm sure people will argue with me about whether we're in the final mile. But I think we're in the final mile of, you know, the whole discrimination, bias, racism kind of thing. You know, forget about our president for a minute. Just talk about society. And the tool that you use when you get to the final mile is not the court. It's not marching in the streets. Even though you see that, it's not really helping. Uh, it's not a civil war. You need, you need the tool that fits the precision of the problem. At this point, you know, this is sort of laser surgery. You need, you need whatever is the cleverest, um, sharpest scalpel to get the final bits out. And to me, that's persuasion and strategy. If you get your persuasion and your strategy right, um, I think that's the last mile. And so, uh, you know, and, and I think that a big part of that is to redefine yourself out of a victim mentality. Um, it seems to me, for example, that aside from the issue of, um, you know, actual abuse, what's, what's the larger category? All the Me Too stuff. Except for the Me Too stuff, which is obviously huge, and you know, I'm not minimizing that, but I'm talking about something else right now. In terms of uh, economic opportunity and, and rights and everything, uh, women are doing better than they've ever done, obviously. In many areas, they're excelling over men. Uh, but at some point, you have to change your frame to... Uh, one of strategy and not victimhood. All right. Uh, Will I help Cernovich run for Congress? I haven't heard that he's running for Congress. Is that a hypothetical question? Um, And by the way, if he does run for Congress... uh, the answer is yes. <laughs> uh, now, I don't know how much help I could be, but if he asked for advice, I would certainly give it to him. Now, of course, that's all conditional. If he ran for Congress and had some policy preferences that I thought were objectionable, then, then no. But if he ran as a, you know, as a Trump Republican, uh, he, uh, he'd be an interesting choice. He's not left to Bernie, neither is Trump. Uh, is the parade thing the biggest blunder Trump has made so far? Well, the idea of the parade is controversial and I thought unnecessary. It did interestingly put his enemies in the weird position of arguing against the military. Did you notice that the budget impasse was broken in part because the the Democrats allowed more military spending? Now, what they got from it was more domestic spending. So that's the story being reported, is that the Democrats got domestic spending, the Republicans got military spending. Neither of them is happy. That's what makes it a compromise. So that's the way it's being reported. Let me tell you the other way it should be reported that it isn't. Here's the other thing that's also true. President Trump, made, by bringing up his parade idea for the military, created a situation where 
you had lots of people who are anti-Trumpers arguing against honoring the military. At the same time, there was a vote on how to fund the military. I think floating the idea of a military parade to honor the troops um, was indirectly powerful persuasion because the Democrats didn't want to be in the position of being against the parade, which was to honor the troops, and also against funding the troops uh, or funding the military as much as Republicans wanted in the same week. It, it, would, it would have been hard for them to put them in the same week. So it's possible that the parade idea was a subtle way to put pressure on the Democrats to fund the military. Now, I'm not going to say that that was necessarily a master plan, but whether or not it was intentional or not, it did work in that way. Persuasion-wise, it worked in that way. Um, so the, the question of whether the parade idea is the worst idea Trump has ever had, it depends entirely upon execution. Now, if it is executed like a, um, like a North Korean parade with big missiles and tanks, worst idea ever. It just makes it real easy for the other side to, to have confirmation bias that, oh my God, he's really a dictator in the making. But if the execution of the military parade, let, let's take just one example. Let's say it's just on the 4th of July. <laughs> All they'd have to do is say, yeah, we're going to have military parades on the 4th of July. And people would say, oh, well, that's the 4th of July. <laughs> if you did it on the 4th of July, you could probably get away with anything because nobody's, nobody's criticizing the military on the 4th of July. Now, if it's not the 4th of July, you still need to get rid of the big, big weapons. And, you know, there have been some other ideas about the best way to maybe have a distributed set of parades where there are smaller events um, that are more local at the same time all over the place. Um, so Trump did say 4th of July, but we, don't, but we also heard that the Pentagon was looking at dates. So a parade with torches would be bad. Yeah, that would be bad. Uh I've got a new call. You want to hear it? Hello? Hello? I guess they gave up. All right. That's all for now. I'm going to go do other stuff.